This flightless female vapor moth is attracting a mate using a scent or sex pheromone. The sex pheromone is a package of chemicals which attracts the male over quite long distances. To produce enough food and natural fiber in the world, we must protect our crops against damage by insect pests. We're all familiar with the damage that the cabbage white butterflies cause to our cabbage crop in Britain. And throughout the world, there are many pests, like the spadoptera moths that are attacking this maize crop, that prevent us achieving the kind of yields we need to. We also find that many insects, like this Culex mosquito, can carry diseases to man. Now, to control these insect pests, we use insecticides. We spray the crops with these materials, and we also spray the breeding sites for insects that might carry human disease. But in our search for more efficient and more safe methods of pest control, we're always looking for new approaches. And one such approach is the use of pheromones, and particularly the sex pheromones, to control the behavior of these pests and thereby prevent damage and prevent disease transmission. One way of using the sex pheromones of moths is in monitoring pest populations. We've identified the sex pheromone of the pea moth, an important pest of peas in the United Kingdom, and we can use the synthetic pheromone in a trap to catch the males. The numbers of males that we catch gives us an idea of the population density, and we can use that information to very accurately time use of insecticides to control this pest. We can even avoid the unnecessary use of insecticides if we find that the population of pea moths that we catch using the pheromone trap is very low. But we can also use sex pheromones to disrupt the mating behavior of moths directly. And this allows us to control the insect by this means. In the case of the pink bollworm, which is an important pest of the cotton crop, obviously an important crop throughout the world as a cash crop and to give us very valuable fiber, we have the sex pheromone forming the basis of a novel approach to control. By disrupting the way the males find the females, we can control the pest population on the crop to the extent that damage is prevented. We're going now to the Overseas Development Natural Resources Institute at Chatham. This is the science unit of the United Kingdom Government Overseas Development Administration. And this laboratory has been responsible for pioneering work on the use of sex pheromones of moths in pest control. We're now going to hear how a moth sex pheromone is identified. And Dr. David Hall of the ODNRI is going to describe the various approaches to this. Well, the identification process broadly consists of three stages. The first is to collect the pheromone. The second is to analyze it and to determine biological activity. And the third is to identify the chemical structures of the active components. We can collect the pheromone either by extracting it from a pheromone gland with organic solvents, or we can actually trap the pheromone that is given off by the insect into the atmosphere. Either of these methods inevitably give us a mixture of components. And to separate out these components, the method of choice is gas chromatography. But even having separated out the components, we, what we really want to know is which of these components are important to the insect, which are biologically active components of the pheromone. And for this, we use a technique which depends on the fact that most insects detect the pheromones by means of receptors on their antennae. And by putting microelectrodes into the antenna, we can record electrical changes that occur when the antenna is exposed to biologically active pheromone components. This device is called an electroantennagraph, or EAG. And what we have done is to couple this to the gas chromatograph as a specific detector for biological activity. Here we have the gas chromatograph. The effluent from the gas chromatograph column is split roughly equally between the conventional GC detector and the electroantennagram 
situated here, just outside the gas chromatograph. The moth is positioned on a plasticine block, and then tiny microelectrodes are inserted into the antenna with these micro manipulators. The output from the microelectrodes is fed through a suitable amplifier to a cathode ray oscilloscope and a fast inkjet recorder. Using this GC EAG combined setup, we have two outputs. We have the conventional output from the gas chromatograph showing the components as they elute from the gas chromatograph. And then simultaneously with this, we have the recording from the EAG, which is, allows us to correlate the biological activity towards the insect of these components and to define the retention times on the gas chromatograph of the active components. Having done that, we can then go on to identify the chemical structures of these active components using a variety of techniques, uh, always bearing in mind that the amounts of material we have are usually at the order of nanograms. One particularly useful technique is gas chromatography combined with mass spectrometry. David, what sort of compounds are involved in moth sex pheromones? Well, moth sex pheromones are typically biosynthetically derived from fatty acids, and so their structure is generally is a long chain of carbon atoms with a functional group at the one end, typically an alcohol, aldehyde, acetate, and then most importantly, one or more double bonds at specific positions in the carbon chain. And as we know, these double bonds can have either the, the Z configuration or the E configuration. So what sort of synthetic strategies do you use for these compounds? Well, if we look at our typical pheromone structure in a retrosynthetic manner, then two obvious points of disconnection are between the two carbon atoms of the double bond, and then here or here between one of the carbon atoms of the double bond and the adjacent methylene group. If we take the first disconnection, then the problem is to form a carbon-carbon double bond between two carbon atoms, and the classical solution to this, of course, is the Wittig reaction. If we look at the second disconnection, then the classical solution to this is acetylenic chemistry in which we generate an acetylenic anion and react this with an electrophile to form our coupled acetylene. And then what about the reduction of that acetylene to the olefin? Well, this is where acetylenic chemistry is very nice for pheromone synthesis in that we have two methods of reduction. We can either do a dissolving metal reduction, um, which gives us very specifically the E double bond, or else we can hydrogenate it over a poison palladium catalyst, which again gives us very specifically the Z double bond. In the particular case of the pink bollworm sex pheromone, what are the compounds here? Well, the pheromone consists of isomers of 711 hexadecadienyl acetate. Um, that is, we have a 16 carbon chain, with an acetate function at the one end, and then two double bonds in the seven and the 11 positions. And what's the situation with isomers in this case? Well, with two double bonds, we have two times two, that's four isomers, and these are the EE, the ZE, the EZ, and the ZZ isomers. And the pheromone actually produced by the female moth is a well-defined one-to-one mixture of two of these isomers, the ZE isomer and the ZZ isomer. And what sort of synthetic strategy do you adopt in the case of this particular pheromone? Well, remembering what we said before, in fact, the way in which these compounds are made on a large industrial scale is to use an acetylenic coupling in which we disconnect here which gives us the right hand of the molecule, which is the same in both isomers, and then we do an acetylenic coupling here to the corresponding two left-hand halves of the molecule, which gives us the two isomers. There is actually another method which has been used on an academic basis, um, in which we generate this 11 double bond by means of a Wittig reaction. And by adjusting the conditions of the Wittig reaction, we can actually get a product 
which contains the two isomers on the 11 bond in the required one-to-one -one ratio by one reaction in one pot. Well, that's really very neat. So the pink ballworm sex pheromone is readily available by synthesis. Let's go now to the laboratories of ICI Agrochemicals at Jellets Hill, where they've developed the synthetic pink ballworm sex pheromone into a formulation that can be used in agriculture. First of all, we'll see what these molecules actually look like using ICI's computer graphics. This is the ZE isomer. You can see the acetate group on the right, and then the 16 carbon chain with the seven double bond in the Z configuration, and at the 11 carbon atom, you can see the double bond in the E configuration. We can make the molecule flip into the ZZ configuration, though of course this would be very difficult to do chemically. We can separate the two isomers with the ZE isomer at the top and the ZZ isomer below. We can then add the van der Waal surfaces to get a better idea of what the molecule looks like in its lowest energy configuration. It's even possible then to rotate the molecules through space. The next step is to establish that the synthetic pheromone contains the correct isomeric mixture. Dr. Susan Crossland is using a gas chromatograph coupled with a mass spectrometer to analyse the sample. Susan, could you tell us what this technique entails? Yes, what we have to do is to inject a microliter of sample onto a polar fusilica capillary column in the gas chromatograph. The sample then passes through into a quadrupole mass spectrometer where it's cyanized and then we collect the results on the VDU screen here. Well, we've made the injection. Uh, how long will it be before the isomers from the pheromones start to emerge? It'll be about two and a half minutes before we see the first isomer coming off. Right, well that's the first, that's the solvent peak coming off there. And the first isomer peak is just coming off. It'll be shortly followed by the second. The second is the ZZ isomer. Okay, so if we halt that run now. Well, we've seen the chromatogram develop. Perhaps we can now see a spectrum from one of the isomers, perhaps the ZE isomer. Yes, the ZE is the first isomer to come off, so we want to look at the spectrum at peak number 185. And if I just expand that part of the spectrum for the molecular ion region at 280, we can see the molecular ion. So we've established that we've got the right compounds there, but do the spectra tell us anything about which isomers we've got? No, the two spectra are very similar. Both isomers have, give virtually the same spectrum. So to establish that we've got the ZE and the ZZ isomers, we really must look at other spectroscopic techniques. Yes, that's right. Well, to establish the stereochemistry of the isomers, we're going to use the nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer. This is a high field instrument with a superconducting magnet and it's, uh, because it's in a, an industrial research laboratory, fitted with an automatic sampler, which gives it the opportunity of taking samples overnight. Now, this is Martin Kipps, who's done the NMR experiments. Martin, what kind of a problem did this set you? Not a very easy one, I'm afraid. This is the uh, proton high field spectrum of the compound. And although we can see we've got four olefinic protons and eight protons on methylenes adjacent to the double bond. There's no information from the coupling constant to tell us the geometry of the double bonds. I see. What about the carbon-13 spectrum? Well, that helps a bit. We can now see from the number of signals that we have got two compounds. And we have the olefinic carbons here and the aliphatic signals. We still have little information as to the geometry of the double bond. But what else can you do then? If we move to this CH correlation experiment, this is a 2D spectrum, and we have the carbon spectrum in one dimension and the proton in the other. Given that the
protons on the methylene groups adjacent to the double bond come at 2 delta. We can find the carbon which correspond to those adjacent to the double bond. And we find that we have 2 at high frequency and 6 at low frequency. And we know from model that the E compound will have its carbons at higher frequency than the Z compound. And so from the spectrum we can show we have two carbons on an E double bond and six on a Z. So we've used the compression of the methylenes to establish that we've got the Z and the E isomers. Well, we've looked at the proton spectrum, we've looked at the carbon-13 spectrum, and then this refinement where we've had a correlation between the carbon and the hydrogen spectra has allowed us to establish that we have indeed got the ZE and the ZZ isomers. We've now got the synthetic pheromone with the correct isomeric composition. The next step is to formulate it so that it can be used in agriculture. Gordon Mars here has been responsible for developing this formulation. Gordon, what sort of problems do you have in formulating a sex pheromone for use in agriculture? The main problem is that because they're unsaturated long-chain esters, they degrade in sunlight and they're very volatile. So if we sprayed them onto a field in a conventional formulation, they would disappear within just a few hours and they wouldn't be effective as a means of control. So what's your objective then in trying to formulate such materials? We set ourselves the objective of producing a controlled release formulation one that would both protect the pheromone against degradation, release it into the atmosphere at the right rate, and be persistent enough to allow us to spray with a prolonged uh, interval between sprays, say two to three weeks between spray applications, and also that the formulation could be sprayed through conventional spray equipment, both from the ground or from the air. Well, that sounds very demanding. How do you go about doing that? We looked at the techniques of microencapsulation to see whether they would, would offer the best approach. And one preferred option that we came up with is a technique called interfacial polymerization. So what exactly is that uh, process then? In this process, um, you take a, a reactive monomer, which is soluble in oil, dissolve it into the pheromone, emulsify that into water to pr prepare an oil and water emulsion. That's the first step and the size of the emulsion will determine the final microcapsule size, so that's an important first step. We then add to that a second reactive monomer. This one is water-soluble, and the two monomers will meet and react at the oil-water interface to produce a polymer by condensation reaction. The polymer is insoluble in both the water phase and the oil phase, and so it comes out of solution and forms a film around the droplets of pheromone. So each droplet will, contain, will be contained within a polymeric film. And what kind of chemistry do you make use of in this polymerization? The sorts of chemistry we can make, we can make um, a polyurea by, for example, starting off with um, an isocyanate material, a diisocyanate as the oil-soluble monomer, and a diamine as the water-soluble monomer. That will give us a linear polyurea. If we introduce polyfunctionality, a third isocyanate group or a third amine group, we can get a cross-linked polymer. And by cross-linking it, that controls, reduces the permeability of the system, so you can control the release by that sort of technique. So what do these microencapsulated formulations look like, then? What we have is an aqueous suspension of microcapsules, which can be diluted and suspends well in, in water and can be sprayed through conventional equipment. Oh yes, uh, it looks uh, just like an ordinary emulsion. You can't actually see the microcaps, Gordon. Well, that's right, that's because they're, they're very fine particle size, typically between one and 10 micrometers. And I can show you here, we've taken some photographs of a cotton leaf, and one has been sprayed with pheromones, and you can see that uh, the leaf surface is covered by very small capsules, spherical capsules. The largest ones are about 10 micrometers, and the smaller ones are about one, down to one. So each sphere, then, is a package of pheromone. How do the pheromones get into the air from the microencapsulated uh, formulation? A combination of uh, release by diffusion through the polymer shell, 
and also the polymers themselves will degrade in, when they're exposed to, to light. The ultraviolet component of light will break down the shell. And so we get diffusive release and also bulk release when the capsule walls are ruptured. And the overall effect of this is that we get uh, an approximately first order decay when they're sprayed into the field. I can show you a typical release rate graph here where filter papers were, were pinned onto the crop and sprayed in the field. They were then taken into the lab and analyzed um, for different periods of time to see how much pheromone is left on, on the filter paper. We then, can then plot a graph of the percentage remaining against the time and we see that the half-life of it is um, between one and two weeks and the pheromone is effective in the field for longer than one half-life. So we can achieve our um, aim of a three to four week spray interval. Well, what is the effect of the slow release of this pheromone on the pest in the field? We found that uh, in the field, for a, a pest like pink bollworm on cotton, we can achieve season-long control of pink bollworm just using pheromone sprays. Uh, four sprays, each of 10 grams of pheromone per hectare, will give us season-long control of the pest in cotton. And that will give us quality of lint and number of bowls, the yield. Um, is equivalent to using a conventional insecticide treatment. Well, we've seen then the spectacular success of using moth sex pheromones in pest control, but for the longer term future, there are other possibilities. So let's return to the AFRC laboratories at Rothamsted to consider some of these. Here we're looking at a different kind of behaviour controlling chemical. These chemicals are preventing feeding by insect pests. This plant is in the labiate family and grows in East Africa and it produces some very potent chemicals that prevent feeding by various kinds of insects. We can take these chemicals out of the plant and identify them using the same kind of techniques that we've used to identify the moth sex pheromones. We can then apply the chemicals to leaves and here you can see the part of the leaf which has been treated with the chemical from this plant preventing feeding by the diamondback moths, which have avidly fed on the part untreated. We can see the same kind of thing for some beetle pests. These mustard beetles, again, have been prevented from feeding on the side of the leaf treated with the antifeedant chemical from this plant. We can also apply these chemicals to field crops and prevent feeding by insects in the field and thereby protect the crops from damage. But in the long term, what we want to do and what we're working towards at the moment is taking the genetic information from plants like this and transferring it to the crop plant so that this plant can then produce these antifeedant chemicals in its own leaves and thereby prevent feeding by insect pests directly.